This broadcast is proudly sponsored by Telecom Australia. Good morning and welcome from the overseas passenger terminal here in Sydney where all the excitement is really happening as the countdown to the Olympic 2000 decision begins. With me this morning, Gary Wilkinson. And boy, the parties are really underway, Gary. Underway? They've been underway <laughs> all night. I've never seen Sydney in, in this kind of mood. I mean, people are intoxicated with the atmosphere and maybe one <laughs> and or two other things. Too, I think. Yes. Now, the spirit here really is amazing tonight. The atmosphere is electric as that countdown begins. And as we said, here we are live at Circular Quay where there are hundreds of people gathered here. And also, um, down on the rocks below us, where thousands and thousands of revelers are joining in the atmosphere. Tens of thousands of people jammed down there and all around the harbour foreshores, but down here at Circular Quay, they've got huge video screens so that they can see what's going on. Uh, they can see the celebrities, and there are many of them, former, present and future Olympians arriving here at the overseas terminal where there is a huge party in progress for 800 specially invited guests who put enormous effort into the Sydney bid. Yes, indeed, they have. Many of those special guests, by the way, will be meeting uh, later on during the program this morning. Former athletes and budding athletes will be meeting those stars. Stars, hopefully, who will be competing here in Sydney in the year 2000 for the Olympics. But that decision we'll find out all oh, in about just under Long an hour's time from now. So it's going to be a, a very, very exciting and historic moment for all of Australia. It'll be fantastic if Sydney can win these Olympic Games. I mean, people say, what's in it? I mean, is it, how much is it going to cost? Can we possibly afford it? $1.7 billion it's going to cost if we mm. get it. Uh, and I think it's going to be worthwhile because the Olympic Games puts in place for a country or a city infrastructures that wouldn't otherwise be built and things that you can amortise over the next three or four decades. That's right. But not only that, Gary, what cost can you put on the pride and the spirit oh. and the energy and the inspiration that we'd be giving to our young children if we host the Games here? I don't think you can put a money cost on that. But anyhow, we have to leave you here from Circular Quay at the moment. We'll be back later on in the programme. But for now, it's back to Monte Carlo. <laughs> This is the Louis II Stadium in Monaco, the venue for the final round of the big Olympic 2000 fight. Welcome to Australia's live coverage of this big decision. The 89 votes have been cast and counted, and only two men know the result the whole world has been waiting for. Surprisingly, one of them isn't the president, Juan Antonio Samaranch, but two other IOC members, a judge from Senegal and a lawyer from Switzerland. Ten years ago on this weekend, Australia too won the America's Cup and a nation celebrated. Let's hope it's a good omen. Absolutely. Over the next hour, what you're going to see is the special IOC television program. A look at the Olympic spirit and the five cities that have spent $150 million to get this far. And then the gold medal, the announcement of the winner. Because tonight, there can be no second prize. Inside the hall, gymnastics hall, there's a tremendous atmosphere. The Australian team has been here for about three hours in their peach t-shirts. And they've been joined by the delegates from Berlin, Manchester, China and Istanbul. And there's a tremendous atmosphere. Walsing Matilda has been ringing throughout this gymnastics hall. And we're all eagerly awaiting the announcement, which will be coming shortly. Yes, it's... Uh It's very much like one of those uh, presidential conventions in America, the Republican or Democratic convention, the uh, delegations from those five cities and their supporters, plus uh, a large press contingent. And this is the uh, coverage we're getting from the International Olympic Committee. This is their official program, which will take about an hour. Mesdames et Messieurs, bonsoir. Bienvenue à Monte Carlo, puisque c'est ici, dans cette cité monégasque, que sera désignée la ville qui organisera les Jeux Olympiques de l'an 2000. Co-hosting with me tonight, it's a great Olympian, 
In her swimming career, she broke 18 world records and won two Olympic gold medals. A lady who has devoted her life to the sport. Bienvenue, Donna de Verona. Bonsoir and merci. Thank you, Boris Aquadro. It's only my pleasure to be sharing the podium with Boris because he is one of the most famous and respected sports commentator in all of the French-speaking world. And what a session we're hosting now. I'd also like to thank your Serene Highness, the Sovereign Prince of Monaco, your family, and all the volunteers here. Let's give them a hand. For hosting this historic 101st session of the International Olympic Committee. <laughs> Mesdames et Messieurs, il y a un peu plus d'une année, nous étions tous réunis à Barcelone pour vivre les Jeux de la 25e Olympiade. Tout avait commencé à Lausanne le 17 octobre 1986, lorsque le, les Jeux avaient été attribués à la cité espagnole. Souvenez-vous. à la ville de Barcelona. In October 1986, I'm sorry, 1986, when Barcelona was awarded the Spanish Games, the Olympic Games in Barcelona. Back. One of the uh, outstanding It was ceremonies. an elegant and friendly Olympics. But it was just three years ago the International Olympic Committee met in Tokyo to choose the city that would host the Games that would celebrate a hundred years of the modern Olympic movement. The International Olympic Committee has awarded the 1996 Olympic Games to the city of Atlanta. Mesdames et messieurs, en ce moment même, ici dans la principauté de Monaco, les membres du CIO délibèrent toujours pour désigner laquelle parmi les cinq cités candidates aura l'honneur et la lourde tâche d'organiser les Jeux de l'an 2000. And we do hope that this voting session will end in time, because we're all anxious to hear the results of the vote, as well as of the approximate one and a half billion people around the world watching this show to see which city wins. And listen to this, for some of them, it's already tomorrow. Well, with the miracle of modern technology, we're going to visit all five cities. And we're going to start with Berlin. To begin, of course, following the order of the presentations today, we cross to Berlin, which hopes to host the Games for the second time, the first time in 1936. Imagine just four years ago, this city divided Germany between East and West. United once again, they hope to host the Games. We have crossed the Mediterranean, the Indian Ocean, and the Pacific to the breathtaking harbor of Sydney, Australia. A roar from the Sydney delegation here in the hall. We're sitting alongside Berlin and Manchester. Melbourne organized the 1956 Games, he's saying, and now Sydney hopes to give a second chance to Australia. It's a great sight, Bruce. Oh, it sure is, Ray, and uh, high hopes here. The third city on the list is Manchester, not a winner in 1990, but bidding here for the second time, Manchester, and considered to be the dark horse tonight. 
The United Kingdom, as we know, has hosted two Olympics, both in London in 1908 and 1948. But now we travel to another country, to the capital of the People's Republic of China, Beijing, to the largest and most populated nation on earth, who's trying to host the Olympic Games for the first time. C'est en 1932 China que la Chine organisait pour la première fois les Jeux Olympiques. Avant, avant 1932, que la Chine participait aux Jeux de Olympiques pour la première fois en 1982. Lors de sa réapparition à l'occasion des Jeux Olympiques de 1984. These are all live, uh, live uh, pictures, of course, coming from these five competing cities. Enfin, enfin, Istanbul. So the fifth and last competitor, Istanbul, Istanbul, the meeting point of Europe and Asia. Some say we're East meets West. And we're being told as well that yes, uh, probably the, the crowd in Sydney is the biggest. city of Istanbul. Now, let's explain the voting system. In order to win, a city must receive the overall majority of votes. If in the first round there is no majority, the city with the least votes will be eliminated. And then the mo members will proceed to a second round. This procedure will continue until one receives, one city receives a clear majority. In each round of voting, the members will vote, obviously, for just one city. Members will not know the number of votes cast in each round. The final result will be known only to the chairman of the voting commission. Even the mo voting members of the International Olympic Committee will not know which city has been chosen until they appear in this very hall tonight. Just the translation again here, a few words uh, about how the vote is conducted. It's a secret vote, one man or one woman per vote, one vote. On the elimination basis, someone said a little bit like musical chairs, the least votes uh, means that you're out. And we get down to four and then we get down to three and uh, if it goes that far we get down to two. The OIC members won't be told the voting figures before the next round and so we expect to hear at the end of the vote uh, when a winner is chosen we'll get a breakdown then of just how Sydney went and how the other cities went. A majority is 45 votes. We, we in Sydney need 45 votes to win this out of 89. And while the members are voting, we have a special opportunity to introduce to you the videos prepared by each bidding city. This will give you an opportunity to experience what the International Olympic Committee members experienced when they viewed the bidding process. And so in this way we're letting you in on a little bit of what went on today. And according to the draw, Berlin is first.
1992, the city's held a ballot and Berlin was given the first position in presenting its uh, case today. We should make the point again, Bruce, that these uh, are presentations prepared by the various cities themselves. To reiterate what my friend Boris said, the cities thought that these bids were so important for this session that today three prime minister and one vice prime minister traveled all the way to Monaco to lead their delegations. Now we have the opportunity to look at a summary of the 45-minute presentation that was made to the IOC during its session. It's just a minute long. I assure you that we will do our utmost to make the Olympic Games in Berlin in the year 2000 an unforgettable event. My wish for the sake of Berlin and of the Olympic movement is that at the end of this day, each and every one of you will say from the bottom of your hearts, like John F. Kennedy did, Ich bin ein Berliner. The reunification was a great gift made to all Germans. Now it is time to say thank you. This is why we would like to host the Olympic Games in Berlin in the year 2000. And I assure you, in the year 2000, Berlin will be even greener and more beautiful than it is already today. Ladies and gentlemen, I am deeply convinced that this city is and will remain a unique symbol for mankind's eternal desire for peace and freedom. Auf Wiedersehen in Berlin, das Vidania Berliner, see you in Berlin. And now we go to uh, the second city, Sydney. Watched uh, in the royal box by the Prime Minister and Mrs. Keating, who are there with Prince Rania. Here's an excerpt from the presentation today. The sites are famous all around the world, and now right in the middle of Sydney, another dream is coming to life. Most of the events for the Sydney Olympics will be held here, a huge waterfront site at Homebush Bay, just 14 kilometres from the city centre. The facelift began two and a half years ago, and there have certainly been some changes since then. And there's obviously still a lot to be done around here, but believe it or not, by the year 2000, this land, about 650 hectares altogether, will have been transformed into one of the most sophisticated sporting venues that's ever been built. And athletes in 14 different sports are going to be running and jumping and throwing around here, sweating it out, trying to win gold. And much of the adrenaline will be pumping right here. This is where the main stadium will be. All the track and field events, with 80,000 people cheering them on. And there won't just be fireworks on the track. This will also be the venue of the spectacular opening and closing ceremonies. The athletes' village will also be in the complex. First time in Olympic history, all the athletes will be housed in the one village. Just a short walk, and competitors will be ready to take part in football, fencing, gymnastics, swimming, archery, and more than half a dozen other sports being held here at Olympic Park. All the other events are within 30 minutes of here. The rowing and canoeing at Penrith Lakes, the road cyclists racing through the beautiful bushland of the Royal National Park, equestrian at Eastern Creek, and the shooting at Holsworthy. And then there's Sydney's renowned harbour. While the yachts sail their way to Olympic glory, a host of other sports are going to be taking place right under the shadow of the Harbour Bridge, including the basketball, weightlifting, table tennis, judo, boxing and wrestling. It'll be a fantastic spectacle. And for the very first time in Olympic history, all the events will take place in the host city, Sydney ready and waiting for the 2000 Olympics. And now let's take a look 
at the highlights from Australia's oldest city, Sydney. So it is with a deep sense of honor and an awareness of this historic unbroken relationship that Australia presents the candidacy of Sydney to host the games of the 27th Olympiad at the dawn of the new millennium. You may be asking why an 11 year old girl is speaking to you today. Well, the reason is that I have a very important message for all of you from the children of Sydney and Australia. Thanks to the Sydney 2000 bid and your visits to our schools, children like me now know a lot more about the Olympic movement. Three years ago, my school friends and I thought that the Olympics were only about sport. From the government and people of Australia, I bring the message that the Sydney bid has the support of all Australians. So from Sydney to Manchester, and uh, it's great being an Australian in the hall at the moment. So get a tremendous round of applause. As Ray mentioned a moment ago, Mr Keating and uh, his wife are watching from the Royal Box. So we go to Manchester now, who were also there in Tokyo. And there's Linford Christie, the great Olympic and world champion. Welcome to the heart of Britain, the heartland of the world's greatest sports. Welcome to Manchester. Manchester is preparing for the highest honour. Preparing for the single most important sporting event in the world. Manchester is famous, not just for its buildings, but for its people, warm and friendly. A friendliness we extend to all who visit, and all who stay. Sport is in our blood. When we aren't playing, we're watching, giving our support to the heroes of today and tomorrow. Manchester is one of the easiest places to get to. A city surrounded by world-famous natural beauty and cultural excellence. It's an inspirational setting for the greatest celebration of sport. And right here, in the heart of the city, we are preparing the venues of sporting excellence. Venues where the world's athletes can truly aspire to the Olympic ideals. Faster. Higher. Stronger. And in the year 2000, we will show the world the true meaning of the Olympic Games. Courage. Honor. Sportsmanship, fair play. We are ready. The world is ready. For the classic games of the modern era. Manchester 2000. Manchester, an historic city in the north of England. Let's take a look at your one-minute summary. I commend Manchester's bid to you. This will be an athlete's games. British sport, all of us from the NOC to the most humble club in the land, are united behind Manchester and their bid to bring the Olympic Games to the very heart of our country. Our development plans offer employment for Manchester people and a substantial legacy for the entire Olympic movement. The city may be Manchester, one of our great cities, but this is a British bid. It has the full and utter support of the government. It will be over 50 years since Great Britain held the Games at your request. 
and at a time when the Olympic flame was so dimmed there was a real chance it might go out forever. You trusted us in 1948 when the world was dark. In the bright dawn of a new century you can trust us. Et maintenant, et maintenant, mesdames et messieurs, direction Asie. Across the other side of the earth to Asia to Beijing, the centre of Chinese culture. At a period of the past, now of course the capital of the Chinese Republic. These are the people of Beijing, the capital city of China. Beijing, a thriving metropolis of 12 million people, the heart of a nation with one-fifth of the world's population, more than one billion people. Beijing, where 4,000 years of civilization is the link to the glories of the past, the vibrant present, and the hopes and aspirations of the future. Today, Beijing is one of the world's great cities whose skyline and contemporary structures, including world-class hotels, continue China's pledge to keep pace with an ever-changing world. And if honored to host the 27th Olympic Games in the year 2000, Beijing pledges to the athletes of the world that the sports arenas, stadiums, and Olympic Village will be the finest ever. For the drawing boards of today, will be the realities of the year 2000. Within sight of the present and future Beijing, its historic places remain as a testament to a dedicated people. The forbidden city that holds centuries of culture and tradition. The Great Wall, a man-made monument to a people who have given civilization endless fruits of inventive genius. Today, the Chinese people's commitment to sport, physical fitness, and the principles of the Olympic movement remains unbroken. A simple beginning at the 1932 Los Angeles Games when China sent a single athlete to Barcelona in 1992 where 251 athletes marched in the opening day ceremonies. There are monuments of stone and steel that are testaments to a nation's existence. But the vibrancy of a society is more than just what man can build. The measure of a nation will in the end be remembered above all else for its people. And the people of Beijing and all of China await with pride the nations of the world in the year 2000, the dawn of a new millennium. As we all know, this is China's first ever bid for the Olympic Games. Let's take a look. Si cet honneur échoua à Pékin, nous ferons tout ce qui nous est possible pour que l'idéal olympique soit propagé à une ampleur sans précédent et que l'universalité de l'Olympisme soit pleinement mise en valeur. Mr. Harry Fogg of Hong Kong, who is with us here today, will donate the stadium of 100,000 seats, showing their wholehearted support for the Beijing 2000. Today, with the possibility of hosting the 2000 Games in Beijing, our athletes now feel they have a chance to return that gesture of welcome and friendship. It is my hope that you distinguished IOC members will give them this chance. We hope you vote for Beijing. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Never put another dimension to Olympic bidding. There's no question about that, Beijing. So from the favourite to the outsider, Istanbul. Istanbul, la ville qui symbolise l'union des continents, reliant l'Europe et l'Asie.
the magical city of Istanbul. A meeting place of religions, cultures, peoples and continents with a glorious history that stretches back over 3,000 years. This is a city proud of its environment, proud of its people and proud of its past. But there is more to Istanbul than a nostalgic yearning for what was. This is a city on the move, a city confidently facing the next century, the next millennium. Eight million people from 26 different ethnic groups have made their homes in Istanbul. 48% of these are under 20 years old. This is the youngest population in Europe, a population that gives the city its cultural and artistic riches. Istanbul, a modern city with an ancient setting at the crossroads of East and West. And it is against this matchless backdrop that Istanbul will stage the 2000 Olympic Games. As a symbol of peace, tolerance and economic success in an emerging region of the world, Istanbul offers the Olympic family a unique platform to send this message of peace to a watching world. The single Olympic village, where all athletes from every discipline will come together in an atmosphere balancing peaceful refuge with shared excitement. This compact village is just 10 minutes from the magnificent Olympic Park, where 15 of the 25 Olympic sports will be contested. This park, built expressly for the 2000 Games, will be a permanent foundation for the Olympic movement to promote its ideals at the point where Europe and Asia meet. The climax of this park is the 80,000 seat Olympic Stadium, centrally located at the highest point. It will furnish the athletes with ultimate state-of-the-art facilities in which to train and perform to their full potential. And after the Games, this park will become the Eurasian Olympic Center, a much-needed venue for the athletes of the 21st century, for the young athletes of Istanbul and this emerging region. Istanbul's Olympic Park will ensure the prosperity of the Olympic ideals, a symbol of fair play, brotherhood and solidarity. It will bring together athletes from around the globe and create an enduring legacy of peace. In Barcelona, 172 nations attended the Games, confirming the expanding role of the Olympics. Well, Istanbul is also a first-time bidder. Welcome, and let's listen to... My people, my very competent friends here, just extended out to me a piece of paper saying, this is what you are to read out to the audience. <laughs> but I decided not to do that. I decided that I would reach out to you with my heart. I stand here before you today as a proud man, proud of my city, proud of the beat, and proud of the team that has dedicated the last two years to strengthening Olympism throughout Turkey. The Istanbul 2000 Games will tremendously enrich the future of our 20 million children who are at this very moment in front of their television sets waiting for your decision, waiting with their hearts filled with hopes. Maybe even more important as to why we should all unite in Istanbul in year 2000 is because we love you. Mesdames et Messieurs, Mesdames et Messieurs, il est un peu now we're going to have a look at the uh, International Olympic Committee headquarters, remembering that back in June, the IOC made a dream into a reality, the dream of Baron de Corbetans, the civil sword. session du CIO, qui s'est tenue à Lausanne, l'un des souhaits du Baron Pierre de Coubertin pouvait enfin se concrétiser. It was the opening of the long-awaited Olympic Museum in the Olympic city of Lausanne, Switzerland.
It was the dream of Baron Pierre de Coubertin, founder in 1894 of the modern Olympic movement, that one day there would be a museum devoted to preserving not only the legacy and culture. Juan Antonio Samaranch, president of the International Olympic Committee, was determined to fulfill de Coubertin's dream by creating a new museum reflecting the Olympic ideal. Nearly 100 years of Olympic artifacts and equipment from de Coubertin's original museum have been carefully collected. June the 23rd, 19... The museum is a celebration of Olympic history that can be enjoyed by all. At last, Baron de Coubertin's dream has been realized. Mesdames et messieurs, we now learn that um, the voting has been completed and that the IOC members are making their way to the stadium. They're a distinguished group with uh, three princes, two princesses, a general, etc. Right? A sheikh, yes, a, a Middle Eastern sheikh, a, a king from the South Sea Island. There are 89 of the uh, the delegates or the members, um, and, we've and we're about 15 minutes over, away from uh, the, make their way the announcement of who has won the games. So no one here knows, of course, as they uh, sit here and wait. In history, for the reason so why we're all here today, Prime Minister, three from the right, and... Uh, Anita so Keating, two from the right, the with uh, Prince Ranier just on the left of the much, screen. Pretty much in the centre there, isn't he? And uh, John Major, of course, is there in that royal box as well as the, uh, the honoured guests. This film we're about to see was made especially for this ceremony tonight by Bud Greenspan, who knows the Olympic this history very well. This is the Olympic Stadium in Athens, the scene of the first modern Olympic Games in 1896. It was here that 311 athletes from 13 countries marched in the opening day parade. The fulfillment of founder Baron de Coubertin's dream that the youth of the world could compete on the athletic field in friendly competition to improve the human race and strengthen understanding amongst all peoples. This philosophy to ennoble and strengthen sport has flourished through the 20th century. And today the world awaits the historic announcement, the naming of the city that will host the games in the year 2000, the dawn of a new millennium, the continuation of a tradition that will be more than a century old. But leading to the millennium, two great cities will play host to thousands of young athletes from many countries. In January 1994, and again in the spring of 1996, an historic ceremony will take place at the altar of Zeus in Olympia, one that dates back almost 3,000 years to ancient Greece, the igniting of the Olympic flame. The first act of a journey, a journey that will end in Lillehammer, Norway, and Atlanta, Georgia. Lillehammer, the scene of the 1994 Olympic Winter Games. Atlanta, the city honored to host the centennial celebration of the 1996 Summer Olympics. Thousands of men, women, and children will carry the torch by day and by night, by land, sea, and air. The bearers of the flame come from every walk of life. The old, the young, the disabled, all bound together by a symbol that through the centuries mystically remains a link to the beginnings of civilization. The flame, the earthly representative of the sun. Just after the final torchbearer enters the stadium to ignite the cauldron, a simple ceremony takes place. 
Then an athlete from the host nation recites the Olympic oath on behalf of all the athletes of the world. We swear that we will take part in the Olympic Games. Respecting and abiding by the rules that govern them. In the true spirit of sportsmanship. For the honor of our country and for the glory of sport. What is it these Olympic Games that separates it from all else? Surely it's the ultimate in talent. Dedication. Pride. And endurance. But it is more than these. Perhaps most of all it is the fulfillment of a dream that one day at a given moment, on a given day, something magical will happen. A performance that will earn the right to stand on the top step of the victory platform. To become the finest in the world. To become an Olympic champion. In the recorded history of ancient Greece, it is well documented how the populace idolized their athletes. Philosophers, orators, and poets sang the praises of their champions. In the Odyssey, the poet Homer wrote, there is no greater glory for a man as long as he lives than that which he wins with his hands and feet. And so in 776 BC, history records that the first Olympic Games took place. And with it, the start of a festival that through the centuries has endured. An everlasting testament to the philosophy of the ancient Olympiads. That these games are truly the truce of gods. And through the decades, the five multicolored rings, the joining together of the continents of the world, have symbolized the Olympic philosophy. For it has been written, these games are the only moments in the history of the world when so many nations come together in the same place at the same time in an association of friendship. And now as the Olympic Games move toward the next century and new horizons, the greatness of the past and present and the hopes and aspirations of the future have been immortalized in Lausanne. In the summer of 1993, President Juan Antonio Samaranch presided at the opening of the magnificent Olympic Museum so that this generation and generations not yet born can live and relive the glory of more than 1,000 years of Olympic achievement. The marathon run commemorates one of the most critical times in the recorded history of man. Dating back to the year 490 BC, when a small band of Athenian soldiers repulsed an invasion by a superior Persian army. There on the plains of Marathon in Greece, an heroic group of warriors won the battle that many historians claim saved Western civilization as we know it today. When victory was assured, a lone Greek warrior ran the hills and mountains of his beloved homeland to Athens to tell those who waited all the news from Marathon. And as he moved over the hills and the countryside, his feet were cut by a jagged stone, but he continued on. Soon he reached the center of Athens and shouted the joyous words to the populace, Ne Nikikamon, yes, we are victorious. Those were his last words. A few seconds later, he died from exhaustion. More than 2,000 years later, the run of this Athenian warrior was commemorated in 1896 when the marathon run became part of the first modern revival of the Olympic Games. 26 miles, 385 yards, a race that tests the fiber of men and women throughout the world. The marathon has provided many memorable moments. In Helsinki in 1952, Emil Zatopek of Czechoslovakia, running in his first marathon, was greeted by a cheering crowd resounding through the stadium. Zatopek, Zatopek, Zatopek. Emil Zatopek had won his fourth Olympic gold medal. Eight years later, Ethiopia's Abibi Bikila, running barefoot, won Ethiopia's first gold medal at the Rome Olympics. But the marathon has demonstrated that there is victory in defeat. 
John Stephen Aquari of Tanzania, the last man to finish the marathon in Mexico City in 1968. Bloodied and bandaged, he finished more than one hour after the winner. A voice called from within to go on, and so he went on. As he moved toward the finish, one journalist was already writing his story. The words, today we have seen a young African runner who symbolizes the finest in the human spirit. A performance that lifts sport out of the category of grown men playing games. A performance that gives true meaning to the word courage. All honor to John Stephen Aquari of Tanzania. Perhaps the words of John Stephen Aquari best epitomize the spirit of the games. Said Aquari, my country did not send me to the Olympic Games to start the race. They sent me to finish the race. These words had no greater meaning than at the 1984 Los Angeles Games, when the marathon became part of the women's program. Then Joan Benoit to the United States, three months after arthroscopic surgery on her knee, won over the obstacles that all marathoners face. The land, the competition, and perhaps most important, oneself. The honor roll is unending when one recalls the greatness of the past 100 years. The grandeur of America's Jesse Owens, four gold medals at the 1936 Berlin Olympics in the 100 meters, 200 meters, long jump, and as part of the 4x100 relay team, a feat once believed would never be equaled. Then, just 12 years later, history was again made by Fanny Blankers Kuhn of Holland, 30 years old and the mother of two small children. At Wembley's Olympic Stadium, she won the 100 meters, 80 meter hurdles, 200 meters, and anchored the four by 100 relay team. Then, 48 years after Jesse Owens' four victories, it would be turned in again by the magnificent Carl Lewis's four gold medals at the 1984 Los Angeles Games, winning in the same events as his idol. Olga Corbett captivated the world at the 1972 Munich Games, giving gymnastics a new dimension. Only to be followed by Romania's Nadia Comaneci, the first gymnast in history to score a perfect 10. Then, 16 years later, the greatest performance in gymnastic history, Vitaly Sherbo of the unified team that was formerly the Soviet Union, the winner of six gold medals. Perhaps the greatest individual performance of any athlete in Olympic history, Mark Spitz's appearance at the 1972 Munich Olympics. Seven events, seven gold medals, seven world records. But greatness in the Olympic Games is not just reserved for athletes from large countries. Rather, it is an arena to achieve immortality for athletes from all countries, large and small. The poignant moments at the 1952 Games, when Josie Bartel won the 1500 meters against the world's best, to become the only gold medal winner Luxembourg has ever produced. Who can forget when Nawal El Mudawakil became the first woman from an Arab nation and the first Moroccan to win a gold medal in 1984? Then those dramatic moments in Barcelona, when Yael Arad of Israel made Olympic history, winning the silver medal in women's judo, the first Olympic medal ever won by an Israeli athlete. Then returning home to dedicate her victory to the 11 Israeli athletes who 20 years earlier were killed by terrorists at the 1972 Munich Olympic Games. But when one speaks of courage and the ability to endure, one must think of Great Britain's Derek Redmond at the 1992 Barcelona Games. In the semi-final of the 400 meters, a race he was destined to win, Redmond pulled a hamstring. His quest for immortality had ended. But he, like many before and many who will come, came to the Olympic Games to finish. To finish a race he began. So Derek Redmond goes on. But Derek Redmond was not alone. From the stands came his father, Jim. Together, 
Derek and Jim Redmond made their way to the finish line. Perhaps the Olympic experience can best be explained by one of the world's great tennis players, Steffi Graf of Germany. In 1988, she reached the heights by winning the Grand Slam of Tennis, the Australian, French and Wimbledon Championships, climaxing her amazing performance by winning the US Open. When asked if winning the Grand Slam was the most important happening of her life, she did not pause a moment. She said simply, the greatest moment I ever had in sport was winning my Olympic gold medal. On the final day of every Olympic Games, there is a celebration. Then thousands of athletes from many countries meet to say their final farewells. And so as the Olympic movement prepares to celebrate the Winter Games in Lillehammer and the Centennial in Atlanta, there are remembrances of the past and hopes for the future. A glorious history of young men and women who through the century have reached for the stars, and some have been fortunate enough to grab hold. It is a history personifying the highest form of the human spirit. And because of it, all of us go back to our homes the better for it. And so the tradition goes on. They have all dared valiantly in the pursuit of excellence. Feelings unknown to those whose lives have never experienced the challenge of victory and defeat. Even more, they have dreamed their dream. Those chosen few who with talent, pride and courage have endured. And so too has the Olympic movement endured. and looks forward to Lillehammer, Atlanta, and then to the next century. When once again, the youth of the world will meet on the playing fields of another great city, the dawn of a new millennium. Everybody here and everybody back home, I'm sure. Thank you, Mr. Bud Greenspan, for your generosity and your commitment to the Olympic movement. Now, it's no surprise the IOC members have arrived. And for all of you with the bidding cities, now you know what it's like to wait before the, you're called up for the big race. So now it's time to announce the city that will be the official host in the year 2000. Boris Aquadro, will you help me? Je vais bien sûr yes, vous we just make the point here that uh, while that film was on, that the members of the IOC, 89 members from all around the world, who have decided uh, while we've been here, including of course Prince Albert of Monaco, they've decided who's going to get those games in the year 2000. They're placed right alongside the Royal Box, Prince Renier applauding them, Prime Minister and Mrs Keating. Ainsi que Donna vient de le dire, il ne reste plus que quelques instants avant le moment fatidique. Et j'aimerais maintenant inviter à nous rejoindre ici sur cette scène dans l'ordre, Maître François Carat, directeur général du CIO. Maître François Carat, directeur of the International Olympic Committee. Madame Anita de France, scrutateur. Membre du CIO aux États-Unis. Anita de France, member of the IOC in the United States. Maître Marc Codler, président de la Commission des Finances, membre du CIO en Suisse. Maître Marc Codler, chairman, Finance Committee, IOC. Two men who know the result. You made the point earlier, Bruce, that in fact there are only, are only two men, including uh, Sam Aranch does not know, even though he's the president and he's the influence, but he doesn't know. And here's the other man, the uh, Singalese judge. They were the scrutineers, they took all the votes today. Dr. Kim Un Young, member du CIO in Korea. Dr. Kim Eun-young, 4th Vice President... Now, the Vice Presidents have been introduced, which will include Kevin Gosper. There are four Vice Presidents in the International Olympic Committee. 3rd Vice President, Mr. Vitaly Smirnov, IOC member in Russia. 
These men are all Le candidates to take over for Mr. Samaranch when he does Monsieur retire. Kevin Gosper, member du CEO in Australia. Second Vice President, Mr. Kevin Gosper in Australia. Et le premier vice président, M. Jian Yang He, membre du CEO en République Populaire de Chine. First Vice Chairman, and in the Chinese way, Mr. He. So China and Australia both represented here in these vice presidents. And now the biggest moment of the lot. Ladies and gentlemen. Mesdames et messieurs. The President of the International Olympic Committee. Le Président du Comité International Olympique. His Excellency Juan Antonio Samaranch. Not a controversial figure, but uh, clearly a man respected Ladies a man and who uh, it's believed to actually the Olympic decide this. The International Olympic Committee wishes to thank the five bidding cities, Beijing, Berlin, Istanbul, Manchester and Sydney for their efforts in presenting the bids and also promoting the Olympic movement. We really regret that there is only one winner. And the winner is...
the, the winner is Cindy, Australia. What a marvellous moment for our country. We have such a tradition in the Olympic arena. And to think that we're here tonight. $27 million that uh, we wondered about. In fact, $60 million altogether to get it from one of the Australian cities in the last three bids has finally paid off with this uh, marvellous occasion. Money extremely well spent. The Prime Minister is... One of the, uh, the three Prime Ministers here today, and he's the only one who has left, with Mrs Keating, and I think they've gone down now to join the Sydney contingent. Yes, uh, they've left the Royal Box, Mrs Keating's have done so much uh, for Well, the feeling today was that it was the best presentation, and that our chances were growing hour by hour. Marvellous scenes back home, and here. But you can never know, could you? That was the point about it. You can... You could never quite know, of course, uh, what was going to happen. This was the vote that they couldn't call. 875 days the Australians like Rod McGeoch have spent trying to get this thing up at $29, $27 billion. And dare I say, I think it's also a victory for the International Olympic Committee as uh, the Prime Minister, Mr Keating, joins the group. And there's the reaction again. Oh yes, there's Rod McGeoch with his Aussie hat. He's a Cobra hat. And the New South Wales Premier, John Fay, can't quite believe it, can they? They've got to try and restore some order here. It's not just the Australians who've gone mad, but I think it's a very popular decision, the, actually. The official contract will be signed. What they have to do the now, IOC, ladies and gentlemen, is, uh, is sign the contract, basically so signing a billion dollars of Australian video, money, Bruce, for these games in the year 2000. It's going to give us all so much to look forward to. So much. This is a very historic game. What a party there will be back And there's uh, Neville I would like Grana to as well. In fact, was the Premier who launched this bid, uh, has since uh, retired from politics. Sydney. Mr. But he Frank has every Sartor. right to feel uh, very happy about this as well. Frank Sartor, of course, the Mayor of Sydney, comes up to sign it. And the Premier, I would believe. There's uh, Graham Lovitz, uh, who has uh, been in charge of the facilities preparations. He's John put... Coates, President John Coates, there you go. John Coates. So John Coates and uh, Frank Sartor will come up and sign the contract which officially says that Sydney takes responsibility for the Games of the year 2000. It might be seven years away, but I can feel it already, can't you? You can indeed feel it already, can't you? And look at the scenes in the street. Well, we were told that they expected 10,000 or so in uh, Manchester today, but we've got many more than that in Sydney, I think. A gift from Frank Sartor. There you go. Frank Sartor is giving Mr. Samaranch an Aussie koala. What a great moment that is. Paul Kitty behind him, John Fay there, the New South Wales Premier. And all those peach t-shirts down the front, they can't quite believe it. Well, and, uh, uh, we thought our hearts were really us today, Bruce, when we said that we thought Australia could win it. But uh, there you go, that's marvellous stuff. And the reactions uh, back in Sydney and right around Australia. And the team here are watching the reactions in Sydney and responding. All right, we might just let this uh, go on, Bruce. Why don't we just have a look at the pictures we have to go down. We've got the, uh, the great pleasure now of interviewing the Australian victors. So we'll let uh, Australia have a look at this and the activity inside the hall, and we'll go down and talk to them. And it is official. The city that will host the games in the year 2000, that will usher in a new millennium, is Sydney, Australia. For Boris Aquadro and myself, we thank you. And for those cities who did not win as an Olympian, I would like to say that I wish you could all win, stay in for the good fight, this was the most extraordinary bidding process in the history of the modern Olympics. Thank you for taking part. Goodbye, farewell, and au revoir. From Boris, Quadro, and me, congratulations to Sydney.
congratulations, oh, Sydney. Yes, we've done it, and it. what a sensational win it is indeed. The atmosphere here is absolutely amazing. It is electric. Oh, I cannot <laughs> believe it. It's st absolutely stunning. I yes. mean, it's easy to say now that it was the right decision all along, but there was always that fear that for some other reason they were going to choose somebody else. But technically, Sydney had to win this bid. I know you've already seen it, but let's just have a look around and see just what the people of Sydney are doing at the moment and celebrating. They are going wild. These were the people down in Circular Quay in Sydney. Tens of thousands of people who are just absolutely uh, hysterical with excitement. Well, Sydney, of all the bidding cities, believe it or not, has put in the most conservative estimate, the most conservative budget for the year 2000 Olympic Games at 1.7 billion. We will get every dollar's worth and more out of that, don't you worry. The infrastructure, the facilities that are going to be built in Sydney, with the people that are going to come here, and with the rest of Australia that's going to be exposed to the world of tourism, it's the shot in the arm this is going to give to the Australian people, to the economy, not only of Sydney, but the rest of the country, will be absolutely phenomenal. Well, if anybody in Sydney was asleep at the moment, they've just been woken up by this almighty fireworks display to celebrate the fact that Sydney has won the right to host the Olympic Games in the year 2000. We have a magnificent display happening at the moment over Sydney Harbour. Those fireworks really are spectacular. And what a fitting place it is. Wouldn't you really say as a modern city to host the Olympics. I can't hear myself thinking. <laughs> it is just fantastic. The spectacle, the noise here at Harborside, the people wiping away the tears, including three-time Australian Olympian Dawn Fraser, triple gold medalist, Melbourne, Rome and Tokyo sitting here with us now at Circular Quay. Dawn, for you, this must be a phenomenal moment. Probably the greatest dream I've ever dreamed about. I, uh, I felt extremely confident. I've always felt confident because I've been on the bid committee. I looked at our technical bid, our security, our, you know, our offerings to the athletes and to their spouses. And I just think that tonight, that the whole country celebrates the year 2000. That Sydney will be able to host the Olympic Games, and all those 10 and 12 and 14 year olds that are out there, congratulations. Train hard, and if you need any help, we're all the old Olympians are here to give you a hand because we're going to win a lot of gold medals in the year 2000. As you can hear, there are a few people out on Sydney Harbour at this early hour of the morning. They're out there on boats, they're on ferries, they're on sailboats and motorboats, and they're all enjoying this magnificent display that we are too behind us on really the most perfect setting in the world. It's about time they recognise that well, this is a place to be, don't you think, Dawn? I think it is. You know, we've got the beautiful harbour, and the thing that I think won Sydney the bid is the fact that the whole of the Olympic Games venues are only within 30 minutes of them. In Barcelona, we had tra uh, transport problems. Oh, the drivers didn't know where to go to. They took sometimes two and a half hours to get to a venue. That's not going to happen in Sydney. And all of those people that are out of work, now you've got to get off your backside and go and get some jobs because they're going to be plenty of them. Hey, Jordan, don't you wish you could plunge back into the pool again and be competing that year? For the year 2000, we may have a Masters, and I'm all going now to back up the Paralympics and try and get the Paralympics now here in this city. That would be a fitting tribute and a way to uh, finish the Olympics that first occur in uh, the year 2000. I don't think you're going to have to tell anybody to celebrate. I think they're all going to be out there doing it. In fact, everyone who's inside of Circular Quay at the moment has just bowed out onto the balcony here to watch uh, exactly what's happening on the harbour. Tell me, psychologically, what do you think it's going to mean to the athletes to be able to compete in their own home? In 1956, when I was first in my first Olympic Games, and I went down to Melbourne, I saw the people on the deck, and you walk out, and you know, all the security in the world, but to be able to walk out on the deck of the pool and someone tap you on the shoulder and say, good luck, Dorney, and you knew it was someone in your own country. Yeah. You know, they, as I said, those kids are 10 and 12 and 14 years old. They should be out. They have now an objective in their mind to start training for the Olympic Games. You're going to compete on your home soil, and I'll tell you what, it's the greatest feeling in the world. Yeah, well, it's a great feeling all around Australia at the moment indeed. If you've just woken up and just heard the news, Australia has won the rights to host the Games in the year 2000. Let's go back now to Monte Carlo. Which is most dear to the Australian heart. Mr. Keating, there's a moment there, though, where uh, Mr. Samaranch paused and actually had to turn the paper upside down there. What were you thinking? <laughs> well, I, I, when I, I, I honestly thought...
thought that the, the long draw at the balloting time was really running in our favour because the tension in here I think was between China and Sydney, between Beijing and Sydney and the, what, what any, anything but a Sydney decision meant for the International Olympic movement and its politics. So I thought the long time was going to help us. So I, I you know, what was hard to, hard to tell. Everyone had serious faces, but I thought we could possibly get there. Mr Keating, can I compare it with winning an election? Are you as excited at the moment as when Labor won? <laughs> I, 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 they're, they're, they're comparable, Bruce, they're comparable. You've always been an excellent numbers cruncher, dare I say, and you've done it again. Oh, well, there's a lot of people crunching this ballot. No, there's a lot of but I, but I, Keating, can we ask you what you thought again? Let's say what you thought that last uh, one minute. I, mean, I, I was really uh, looking at Kevin Gosford's face and I thought he looked pretty confident. <laughs> he was so sitting off to one side. Now we have to thank you. Mm -hmm. I think we think that uh, you were one of those, uh, the mystery uh, weapons that we had today. Thank you. She made a very moving speech today and I think it had a lot to do with our victory. Thank you very much. <laughs> but it was a teamwork. We all worked very hard. We all worked very hard when we were in Barcelona too. But on the margin yeah. of two, everyone's in that yeah. one, you see. Tell us the vote then, Mr. We didn't see the breakdown. Tell us what the, what the vote was. I think there were four eliminating ballots, and as, as I understand, Australia had about 30 votes all the way through, and when, as I understand it, when Berlin went out, the votes, the Berlin votes came to Australia. Was and, it basically and, and the, against China, though, in the end, I against Beijing? I think in the final playoff, it was uh, Australia 45 to Beijing 43. Could we possibly declare a public holiday back home? <laughs> well, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure about that, but I know there'll be a lot of celebrating going on. Now, Paul, what would you say to any boss who uh, they got crook if uh, someone didn't turn up at work today? <laughs> well, I, well I, think that, uh, I think that there's a... We'll have the time to savour this one and build towards this one because we've still got to make this the Olympics we hope it to be. And I think I think that's that's what we're looking forward to, 2000. You're not going to have any champagne poured all over you tonight, are you? No, I, well, I'll be, I'll be pouring a little bit inside now, I can assure you. <laughs> are you going to the football finals on the weekend? Uh, well, Canterbury, I told... No, I told... Uh, Canterbury, my team sort of got uh, knocked out last weekend, so it probably sees me out of that. But, Mr Keating, our team won tonight, and that's the most our important team, Our team, that's right. The Australian team won tonight, and that's the most important thing. We'll be looking for the recovery. We don't want to wait till the year 2000, but certainly this uh, is... Well, this should be a great confidence builder for the country, you know, to think that, in, that, that we can hack it in the big, in the big swim of, an, in, of an, inter an international decision like the Olympic Games. I think this is a should be a great confidence builder for, Met for Australians to know that they're up there with the rest, that they're taken seriously, and Australia really ranks out there. And right. what about your young family? Because we used an 11-year-old today, and she talked about the excitement of young people in Australia. Your young family, how do you think they might react to oh, this? I think, well, they're, they're, they all play sport, and they'll be, they'll be as, as keen about this, I think, as most young Australians will. We're, we've now got, you know, the better part of a decade to work up to this. Well, thank you very much, thank and it's been a tremendous victory right. for us. Great victory. Thank you. Boys, camera here. Just stay one on one. Just leave one on. Get ready. Where's the camera? Micheline, camera. We're just waiting on a camera here. We're very much under control of the French television, but uh, Rob McGeek, I want to talk to you. Congratulations. Uh, Paul Keating is getting a lot of attention right now, but... Uh, IOC member from New Zealand. Is that right? You're lazy buggy, you'll have to do some work now, he said. You've done a lot of work, it's, I think 875 days, you tell me. Oh yeah, but you know, I've got a wonderful staff of 40 odd people there and uh, half of them are at home. I'm sad about that, looking forward to getting back to be with them. And uh, I always said if we won that the first words I should utter are for my staff and, and I mean that. Right, now, now tell us what went through your mind again today. There was just no way, when we talked to Olympic experts here, they said it's too close, we can't pick this one. Well I thought we'd, and I said to you yesterday, Ray, privately, that I we'd win. I've always thought that there were too many votes being counted for Beijing that actually weren't there. I was slightly wrong because it went to the fourth round and there were only a couple of votes in it. Um, what do you think did it then? I mean, there was so much talk about uh, the push that uh, Mr. Samaranch may have and uh, the fact that we, it was a juggernaut called uh, China. I think we uh, campaigned well, but I think in the end the popularity of Australia really got us there. The popularity, it was a very popular vote, wasn't it, here? I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, it's a popular place. I mean, it's a wonderful place, Australia. And, uh, you know, the sort of support we had, I mean, where else can you raise 15 million? dollars in the middle of a recession like that. I mean, the Australians deserve to have the game. Well, I think as well, we talk, we understand there's a bigger crowd in Sydney now, Darling Harbour, than either in Beijing or in Manchester. Well, that's good. I'm pleased to hear that. <laughs>
I hope they have a great time. Uh, Bruce, you've got John Case, another one of those we need to thank. Yes, Thanks, the Rod, president of the uh, Australian Olympic Committee, the man who uh, just signed the document. John, today in your presentation, you talked about the athletes and what Sydney can do for the athletes. I'm sure every athlete in Australia right now is rejoicing. It's going to be a tremendous legacy for our athletes and those of the world. Uh, we've won it on technical merit, which we always thought we would. Uh, it's a bit closer than I thought it was, though. Your faith was never dim, though, because I, I know that all along you stood firm and you felt we had the numbers. No, we thought we had around the 30 in the first round. That's what we had. Um, I was a bit surprised, as it turns out, that some of the Istanbul and Berlin votes didn't come to us and it uh, took until Manchester went out. But we got there. We sure did. I believe we were behind going into the last round and we've ended up winning by two votes. We were behind by three into the last round, so we had to get eight of Manchester's 11 to win. Tell us about some of the competitions that now may occur in Australia in the oh. seven years leading up. In the seven years leading up, we are obligated in every sport to uh, host a world championship or the like to prepare. Uh, just for Australian sport alone from the Olympic Committee, there will be another $100 million that we will be able to inject into sport. Uh, we will have a full team in every sport in Atlanta. Um, and obviously we'll have a full team when we host the game. The impact on Australian sport will be what it was for Melbourne in 1956. All right, John, congratulations. John Fay, what's it mean to New South Wales? What's it mean to Australia? It, it means that uh, merit has been recognised, sport's the winner, and the Sydney people have, have had a wish which has simply been overpowering right throughout the world to a point that that name came out of the envelope. I am just so thrilled but for John, them for the support they gave us. John, we saw some footage afterwards of uh, when that decision was announced. You just about uh, went into orbit. Well, I have to say that there was some pent-up emotion there. It's, it's been coming for a long, long time because you can wish for all you want. You've still got to make it work. I think we made it work, but nevertheless, the burst, the burst of energy was there and... Uh, I let a little bit go. I'm delighted though, I'm delighted. Of course, the task now begins. And could I say this, that we showed through this bid that we were capable of uniting as a community. If we can continue to do that, not just for the games, but also for all that we do, that ingenuity, that brilliance that comes through at times, that's gonna put Australia ahead uh, in leaps and bounds, right down through to the games and beyond. It's a cue then Bob Carter come in because it was united. I can't remember since the America's Cup where all parties and all people have been together on this one. It was fantastic. fantastic. It was a win for the people of Sydney, both sides of politics, the whole community behind this, and I think it was the, the reason we won. Uh, it was a contrast with the other bids, our competitors. We were united, our community, our political system, all our political leaders united behind this, making it a victory for the people of New South Wales. Can I go further and say it's a victory for Australia because we know that now the cameras are going to come down, the focus is going to be the spot it's going to be on Australia. We know that, in fact, every part of Australia, from one end to the other, is going to, is going to benefit from this. Well, of course, we took people through the land in our presentation today, and uh, we're Australians. The city was Sydney, but without any doubt, uh, Australia is going to benefit as a result of that. All right, now, economically, again, gentlemen, uh, what, what should we talk about? They're talking about uh, 150,000 more jobs, 156,000 jobs, uh, $7.3 billion from the, uh, the Pete Marwick uh, assessment. Uh, I think the fact is that this is the catalyst that's going to get the confidence going in Australia. Uh, that's what we needed. We needed the boost. We've got it. And I think tomorrow they're going to go out with renewed vigour and do things even better than they usually do it. Bob, it, it clinches Sydney as the city of the next century. That, that's its, its, its absolute significance. We are the city of the next century. Let's we, talk we about Australia too, Bob. Yep. Uh, a great win for Australia, no doubt about that. Congratulations. Let's just go across to uh, Bruce. It's all yours. Thank you. Bon, mesdames, messieurs, j'ai l'honneur de vous communiquer les résultats. Well, share the spirit, Australia. Sydney has won the games, but it was a close run thing, 45 um, over to 43. Yes, we're staging the runner-up, so it really was such a go there for a while, but we managed to do it. It doesn't matter by how many points to win, we won that race. Mm -hmm. So stay tuned to Channel 7, we'll be back with more of the announcements. You're watching Sydney's uh, successful win of the year 2000 Olympics. Back with more in a month. <laughs> Congratulations, Sydney, on winning the Olympic bid from one of your major sponsors. If you want the league finals lowdown, Seven News has it. And because you need to know more, we'll still deliver Sydney's most complete news, all the day's major events, and the inside story on league. Tonight at 6 on Seven Nightly News.
Off-road racing stadium style comes to Parramatta Raceway for one night only this Saturday when Triple M presents the stadium off-road Grand Prix. It's four-wheel drive fight night with pickup trucks that'll run a month and an American Nissan that VA Fords won't be missing. Buggies, tin tops and quads jumping high into the sky. Plus Gaul and Dak in a motocross match race attack. The Triple M Stadium Off-Road Grand Prix, a high-flying family motorsport spectacular. Seven o'clock this Saturday night at Parramatta Raceway. Who is it? Hi, my aches and pains are much better, and I really believe they've been helped by this bracelet. Absolutely, Sam. And it really does seem to assist. I feel more energized and vibrant. Introducing the amazing magnetic power bracelet. It's a beautiful piece of jewelry set with three rare earth magnets which make contact with the relaxation pressure points of your wrist. The magnetic power bracelet is only $59.95, and that includes delivery. Call 008 630 008 now to purchase your magnetic power bracelet. You can pay with credit card or check. I honestly don't know how or why it assists, but it does seem to help my aches and pains. You know, I don't believe in hocus-pocus, and when I first received this bracelet, I didn't know if it would help, but it has. However, we can't promise any therapeutic or magical cures, and we make absolutely no medical claims whatsoever. But truthfully, since Pam and I first put these bracelets on, we really have felt much better. Here's the ultimate stress bracelet. Magnetic power, copper and trace elements and beautifully finished in 24 karat gold plating or silver. Available in small or large fittings. The magnetic power bracelet is presented in a great suede pouch. Buy two and you'll receive free a 24 karat gold plated magnetic pendant and chain. Order your magnetic power bracelet now. $59.95 includes delivery. Phone 008 630 008. That's 008 630 008. Buy two and receive a free gold plated magnetic pendant and chain. To everyone who put in the hard yards for the Sydney 2000 bin, congratulations. No one deserves an ice cold to is more than you. Young, out of work, with no future? I was losing all hope. Don't despair. Real life has the answer. And we hope to turn on a spark in them. It's limitless. A scheme that could take you from rags to riches. Real life, tonight at 6.30. This broadcast is proudly sponsored by Telecom Australia. back to Sydney in Australia. Well, believe it or not, we've won. We've won the rights to host the games in the year 2000. <laughs> you know, your heart's still yeah, beating, is it? still going. Yeah. Well, I think indeed. We can hear everybody's hearts where we are here at the party in Circular Quay. But let's go down to where the people are in Circular Quay. And Andy Raymond is there with a the town crier. With him. <laughs> Hi, Andy. Thailand, yes, what an incredible feeling down here. 50,000 plus people all going absolutely wild. Forget about the year 2000 for the moment. We've got to get over the party tonight. With me is town crier Graham Keating. What an incredible feeling. The atmosphere is absolutely electric. You cannot describe it. We have all worked so hard for this moment and it's finally arrived. May God bless the fair city of Sydney! I've had some money on a few shonky horses in my time, but not that one. Now, I wonder how many of those revellers down there are actually going to be making it to work uh, this morning, 5 a.m., almost 5 a.m. at the moment. I think uh, a few of them might be going with very sore, but happy heads, anyhow, when they get there. Now, Cameron Williams is over at Homewood, and uh, that's where a lot of excitement is happening, too. Of course, that's going to be the site of the next Olympic Games in the year 2000. Good morning, Cameron. Good morning, Anne. Yes, this is now officially the, the site for the swimming, the athletics, the basketball, the weightlifting, lots of sports out here. And the wonderful thing about uh, being amongst the three or 4,000 people that are out here tonight is the fact that most of them are children, and, and in seven years' time, they're really going to reap the benefit of tonight's announcement. It was an absolutely joyous occasion. I don't know that anyone really, really, really believed that we could do it. I think we all felt a bit too cynical that Beijing had it in the bag, and it was absolutely euphoric. It was a wonderful moment. And uh, champion Ironman Craig Riddington was one of the people out here to enjoy it. Craig, a sensational feeling. Yeah, what a feeling. It's electric out here at, uh, what, Olympic Park, we call it. And uh, I must say, it was we were sort of expecting a bit of an anti-climax uh, out here. But uh, I must say that I've competed in many uh, races over the years and represented my country a lot of times. I've never been so nervous as I was before that decision came out. I have to admit that uh, I felt exactly the same way. There was a, a great moment of tension there. Tell me... Uh, 
you know, you haven't competed in Olympic Games, but, but you've got a lot of friends who have. What does it mean for an athlete to know that, uh, that he can compete in his own country in front of his home crowd in the greatest arena that there is for an athlete? Yeah, well, winning the Olympic Games uh, is the pinnacle of uh, all sporting achievement and uh, for our Australian athletes it's just going to be a massive bonus to know that they're going to come to their hometown and compete in front of their home crowds and uh, I must say it would be something I would always love to do but uh, I will not get the opportunity but uh, we'll certainly see some great athletes come up. I guess, I don't want to uh, put any thoughts of early retirement in your mind, but I guess by the year 2000 you might have uh, given the swimming game away, but uh, your restaurant at Manly could be booming by then, so for a small businessman, this is a great announcement as well, isn't it? Exactly, yeah, I've got a Mexican restaurant in Sydney and uh, in Manly, and I think that'll be booming, and uh, I think I might even be a coach by then. Yeah? Maybe more gold for you as a coach then? Yeah, well, hopefully, yeah. Well, there'll be a lot of our young competitors coming up for sure. Thanks very much, Craig. So, Anne, it's an absolutely wonderful occasion out here. I think people are going to stay around, so we will too. Good. Thank you very much, Cameron. We look forward to talking to you again soon. Can you imagine the hub of excitement and activity Homebush is going to be in the year 2000? I think the Homebush plan is something that swung the bid in Sydney's favour because of the existing venues and the fact that they've just allocated the state government another $100 million uh, towards the construction of the major facilities there. Uh, it had to swing the bid in Sydney. Yes, they also understand that we actually have progressed further with our building of our Olympic Stadium. Atlanta has uh, the next game, so that must have them as well. Let's take our uh, check of reactions to this uh, phenomenal decision right round Australia's game, north of Brisbane now, where Paddy Welsh is with the Australian cricket captain, Alan Border. Well, Alan, the news is all good from Monte Carlo. Well, it's absolutely sensational, Patrick. I set the alarm to get up to the announcement and... Uh, well, over the moon, I, sp I suppose uh, everyone in Australia should feel really proud of uh, the effort that's gone in. It's uh, just fantastic for Australia and Sydney in particular. You've spent four of the last five months in England. Uh, were they confident over there? Well, they were quietly confident in Manchester, and uh, uh, I just think uh, Sydney is a, a far better venue than uh, well anywhere else, and uh, we'll prove that uh, come the 2000 Games. A lot of hype about it, and uh, I suppose now they can get down to the serious business of preparing for an Olympic Games. Well, that's right. It's, I suppose it's uh, you know, like a dream come true for all our athletes and, and people who have put all the effort in behind the scenes. But, uh, yeah, I think it's just absolutely sensational news. And, um, you know, come on 2000, it's going to be great. Well, by the year 2000, you'll be a professional sports watcher by then. <laughs> uh, you'll be looking forward to it? I'll, I'll be, I'll be uh, putting in for tickets uh, well as soon as possible, Patrick. Uh, it's going to be a huge event and uh, get in quick. All right, well, thanks for staying up so late. Yeah, thanks very much, Patrick. It's uh, been a pleasure. Yeah, good reaction there from uh, Brisbane, and the people right around Australia are very excited by the news. Because it really is an Australian win. It's not oh. a win for the It's a win for the entire country, and I think we can all be very proud. The games are going to be held in one city, but I'm sure that people right around the country are going to be involved. Well, our last home Olympics, our first home Olympics in Melbourne, where Australia's most successful to date, we've 13, 13 gold medals there, which we've never done in any other Olympic game. I wonder how many we might win in Sydney. Well, as Gordon Fraser said just a little while ago, I think it's the inspiration of being able to compete in front of a home crowd. It makes you spur on with a little bit of extra energy. Okay. We're talking about Olympians. Right now, Joanna Griggs is speaking with Julie McDonald. Good morning, Joanna. <laughs> Good morning, Anne. If we can see you through the balloon. Absolutely incredible feeling in there when they announced it. Everybody jumped out. It's such, certainly a very emotional moment. I've got with me Julie McDonald, who was bronze medalist at 1988 and 800 metres freestyle, competed at the 1992 Olympics. Julie, will you go on to 2000? <laughs> oh, it was very tempting once everyone announced. Oh, couldn't believe it. Uh, Lee Hadlin and I were just jumping up screaming, and it was just so exciting. I thought, oh, I should make a comeback, but, um, you know, oh, I just couldn't believe it. I really thought Beijing would get it, and oh, it's so exciting, yeah. What would you say is, is the greatest thing about the Olympics, and, and, and what would be so special if it comes to Sydney? Well, it, well, it is at Sydney. Yeah, it's, uh, it's just so emotional, you know. Uh, all the athletes, you know, they put their lifetime into training and they get up there and they represent their country and they're always so proud and that's, that's a big thing and, you know, Australians are very emotional with their sport. They love all their sports people and it's just so exciting. I just can't wait for the year 2000. I think it's great when you see so many people just grab anybody. You didn't even know <laughs> half the people. Everybody was hugging each other. Yeah. That's what the Olympics does. That's right. It's, it's all about um, being very emotional and getting to know everyone. And when, when something like that, and as big as that, and being swamped by balloons, um, 
is, you know, it comes to Sydney, I think, you know, everyone's just going to go just off their head, I think, you know, it's just going to be the best Olympics ever. Okay. This backdrop, how can we ever go wrong? <laughs> All right, thanks very much, Joanne. Thank you, too. She's really one of our uh, great Olympians there. Now, of course, uh, talking about great Olympians, most of them are training at the Australian Institute of Sport uh, down in Canberra, and that's where our reporter Helen McCabe is at the moment. Helen, good morning to you. What's the atmosphere like there in Canberra? Good morning. Yes, it's an amazing feeling here. I'm here at the AIS in Canberra, and I'm talking to Jim Ferguson, who's the executive director of the Australian Sports Commission. Jim, what an amazing amazing feeling here in Canberra. <laughs> it's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm hoarse from the outing. I can understand it. The reaction here was quite extraordinary. The athletes just went uh, Oh, well, yeah. That's what it's for, eventually, to the athletes. And a lot of the kids here will, in fact, be competing in 2000 in Sydney. What exactly does it mean to Australian sport? Well, it's a huge boost. It's a huge boost for Australia. It's a huge boost for Australian sport. There's no doubt about it. The Olympics is the biggest show on earth. And uh, I think it'll give a great boost to the country. It'll give a great boost to it in terms of uh, national prestige, uh, national fitness, and uh, it's great for Australian sport. The athletes here have already said that uh, they'll try three times as hard from now on. Well, they already try pretty hard. That's really good. <laughs> they try three times as hard. We will beat them definitely. I mean, as I said, the reaction here was quite extraordinary. But some of these kids will actually be competing in the in the Sydney Olympics. Oh yes, and that's uh, the group that you uh, interviewed a short while ago. Uh, quite a few of the gymnasts there in the structure in the year 2000. And how old are they? Uh, they're they're a bit older than they look actually, but they're sort of uh, 12, 13, 14. How long do you think the party will continue here in Canada? Oh, I think quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> Robert Dickens said a minute ago when he spoke to the uh, spoke to the audience that it will lay the foundation for Australian sport over the next decade. Is that correct? Oh, there's no doubt about that. Yes, it'll be an absolute focus for everything we do. I think from the commission's point of view, we want to make sure that it's an Olympic for all Australians and for all Australian sport. And, and that's what we'll be aiming to do. Well, I'm sure it will be. Thank you very much, Jim. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. We'll take it back to the studio now. All right. Thank you, Alan. For those kids of the yeah. AIS, what they've got to look forward to now. Yeah. I mean, they're the kids that, of course, will be competing in the year 2000 games. So, what an inspiration for them. One of them could carry the torch into the stadium in the year 2000. Yes, well, not too many of us have a chance to be the centre of world attention, but that seems the wrong part as he ran into the Melbourne Cricket Ground with the Olympic torch in 1956. One of our greatest competitors, Ron's in London now. But he's sharing the spirit of Sydney's Olympic win. Ron, great news for Sydney and for Australia. What's it going to do for the city and the country? That's a, a phenomenal. It's, I suppose everyone sort of gets together. Um What's it going to do for the city and the country? That's a, a phenomenal. It's, I suppose everyone sort of gets together um, at, at the games. There is no such event as the games in, in, in the world. It's a, the coming together of so many people, there's excitement, it's, uh, it's a, a fortnight or three weeks of actually see the light, both for, for excellence and for everything, but excellence in the sport and, uh, and the people that are in the, in the city and the excitement it generates. Uh, uh, I've never, I've been to about six games now and I've never failed to come away absolutely amazed at just how exciting the time it is. Well, the logistics of staging such a mammoth event, is Sydney up to it? Oh yeah, I think so. Well, Melbourne up to it in 56, I know it's got twice as big or three times as big since then, but uh, Sydney, uh, I think Australians are very good organisers, and that will give uh, the hospitality international-wise, I, I don't think anybody can beat Australians, this is the most hospitable people of all time, uh, anyone who goes across to, to Sydney will really enjoy themselves, and that's what, in the end, they come away thinking about, A, the stand of the game, but B, the hospitality of the community. What was it about Sydney's bid, do you think? Is, is it is it the climate of Australia? Is it just the organisation? Is it uh, the, both the beauty of the city? But most of all, the bid was the best by far as, as far as the facilities are concerned. And that's frankly unusual for the Olympics to be won by, uh, by technical uh, expertise such as that. And it's about time it has, has been. Sydney was by far the best, uh, the best bid athletic-wise.
living here in London, obviously you've, you've seen and heard of Sydney's bid and what they put forward. Were you impressed by it? Yes, yes. I, I thought Melbourne was a good bid uh, for the previous games and we, and we failed and I think we failed for other things than the technicality of the bid and I'm glad Sydney have done it. And Sydney, it was reduced the equal to, uh, to Melbourne, if not better. So you would say the people of Sydney and Australia towards the year 2000 can look forward to some uh, some big changes, exciting times. Yes, I reckon I'll be back. <laughs> sure, I know that it will be a wonderful time. The, the build-up is tremendous, but the, the, uh, the fortnight or three weeks itself uh, are just unbelievable. Great man, Ron Clark, and really the Olympic competitive spirit. Chair the third operator, Sydney has got the year 2000 game back up in the Congratulations, Sydney, on winning the Olympic bid from one of your major sponsors. Saturday, Celebrate with Seven starting at 11 a.m. And at 2, join the millions around the world for Carlton Essendon, the clash of the Titans. Proudly presented by these sponsors exclusively on Seven. Hi, I'm Tim Shaw from Dentel. Tell me, have you got a kitchen drawer full of dull knives that need sharpening? I know I have. Well, let me introduce you to Demtel's King's Collection of Knives, a set of stainless steel knives that'll stay sharp forever. They cut perfectly every time, slice effortlessly through veggies, bread and meat, as well as cut through frozen or difficult foods. That handle is tough and designed to also last for ages. The ultra-resilient stainless steel blade stays sharp even after cutting through leather, wood, or this steel hammer. And it still cuts like a laser. In this great offer, you'll also get a matching filleting knife featuring a flexible blade. It's great for those fine jobs like fish. But there's more, a paring knife and this really useful cleaver. This is one knife you'll really love. That's some of the sharpest, handiest knives you'll ever need to own in your kitchen. But there's still more, because we'll even include this hand slicer, butcher's knife, boner, it gets better, as well as a cheese knife, you'll never need or want another knife. Look, it's priced at almost $100. Forget it, because this is Demtel, and in this offer, it's all yours for just $49.95. But I know you want more. What about eight matching steak knives? They're priced at almost $30 alone, great for barbecues, but what you've got to do, ring us in the next 15 minutes, and we'll even include this two-piece carving set. This is truly an amazing offer. Ten of the most useful, sharpest knives you'll ever own, eight matching steak knives for barbecuing, and the two-piece carving set, Demtel's money-back guarantee. What more could you want for $49.95 plus postage and handling? Look again how effortlessly it cuts through the shoe and then the tomato. Go on, treat yourself. Pick up the phone now for the King's Collection today. Ring 0080230025. That's right, 0080230025. Even if you don't have a credit card, you can ring and order the King's Collection today. Jeff Patterson and Bennett Player present the Foster Special Fight Night. Fists of Fury. Mike Cheney and Alex Tui in the controversial rematch of the year. Also, Craig Peterson takes on David Ravu Ravu for the Australasian heavyweight title. And Tony Weeby meets Dean Hanna for the New South Wales featherweight title. Plus, Scott Simons against Molly the Tongan Tiger Kasusi. And Rude Kennedy glove to glove against Joe Kiwi Kingy. Sydney Convention Center, Saturday, September 25, 7 p.m. Tickets from Ticketek and at the door. See you at the Foster Special Fight. Be there. Where will you find Australia's largest range of quality carpets? Ha -ha! Solomon's. Carpet specialists for over 100 years. Don't you know it's magic? Solomon's Carpet. Oh, baby, it's magic. Call us. The peaceful silence of Bathurst is about to be cracked by the thunder of the mighty V8, not to mention the arrival of Doug Murray. I love the smell of V8 in the morning. Ha -ha! 1,000 exclusive to seven. This broadcast is proudly sponsored by Telecom Australia. Welcome back to Sydney's coverage of the Games announcement. Sydney has won the Games. It is chaotic here at the harbour side. Thousands upon thousands of people thronging the streets. The harbour itself alive with vessels, crammed with people. I don't think anybody's going to go to work today. 
a far cry, I guess, from the atmosphere, the subdued atmosphere, at the first of the modern Olympics in Athens in 1896, where a man called Spiridon Lewis won the first of the modern Olympic marathon. Australia's Robert D. Costello was never able to equal that feat in the Olympic Games, but he certainly is a greatest ever marathon runner. The man who now heads up the Institute of Sport in Canberra is with Helen McKay. Thank you, Gary. Yes, I have got Robert DiCostello here with me. Robert, what was your sentiment when that uh, when that announcement came through? I I, um, I couldn't believe it actually. I, I really, you know, deep down in my heart, thought that we'd miss out. Um, I thought that the other the other sort of uh, less idealistic uh, influences would would overwhelm us and uh, and we'd miss out. But uh, to to actually hear uh, Juan Antonio Antonio Samaranch come out and say Sydney it was just a, a shock. More than anything else, I was just absolutely stunned. And uh, you know, we've been talking and planning for the last six months about things that we might put in place or that we need to put in place. But uh, you never really, you know, wanted to. I think think that we had we had it uh, had a, a good chance. So, yeah, I must so. tell I must tell everyone that uh, when the announcement came through that we had our cameras on you and uh, that Robert's reaction was quite quite unbelievable. That you really you really did feel that this well, was perhaps the greatest thing to happen to Australia before. Well, I think it's it's a tremendous thing. For Australia, you know, not only sport but for, for Australia as, as a nation. It's also a, a, a tremendous thing. It's probably the greatest day in Australian sport uh, and it's going to bring about the, the greatest change in Australian sport since, you know, since the sort of the 50s when, when Australia dominated internationally because, because international sport was so, sort of something that you participated in rather than something that was really sophisticated and well organised. And, uh, you know, we've come a long way in the last, the last 10 years. Barcelona was a tremendous Olympics for, for Australia and uh, I think Atlanta is going to, to be better and, and now you know the challenge is there for us to, to really put in place everything that we need to make 2000 in Australia truly representative of what Australia is all about and that's uh, success, hard work, challenge, achievement, all of these things which, uh, which typify Australia as a nation we have to start to implement now Seven years is not a long time in international sporting terms. A lot of the kids that we're going to be that are going to be representing Australia in 2000 are still at school. So you know, 12 to, to 15 year olds. And uh, in the past, we've never been able to target them. We've never been able to to really do anything with them because our resources have been limited. And we've we've had to concentrate on the athletes that are already representing Australia, not think about the ones that might be representing Australia in seven years' time. So so now, what we have to do is to to put in place programs and activities and work with the, the governments and the states and the sports to bring about that. Well, you've played a huge role in Australian sport. Will you be staying around as director of the AIS? Uh, look, I, I want to be part of it. Um, <laughs> there's there's no, no doubt. I, I, want to, I want to be part of the Olympics in, in Australia in 2000. Um, I, I, the only thing I can guarantee is that I won't be running in the marathon. <laughs> but uh, if, it's, if it's here at the Institute, um, that'd be great. Terrific. Thank you very much. Robert Dickerstella, back to you. Thank you very much, Helen. <laughs> there. We're just having a chat amongst ourselves because this is the man who knows all about winning. Not Should we encourage him to say it? Yes, go, 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 go to Australia. <laughs> you ripper. Yeah. Yeah. I tell you what, I only ever see you two on marvellous occasions. Remember Gary? Yes. Uh, well, lots of you two have got lots of okay. things to win. Ears rock with Anne. Yes. And Chief Bison, can you all um, advertisement? Celebration. And now we're back right. here. This is the best thing that's happened oh. to our city and our country, I think, for a hundred years. Absolutely. You know, the, the, the confidence we need, we've got it. Remember back prior to 1956, Melbourne won the Olympic Games against Buenos Aires by one vote, right? Now, four years ago, they gave it to Atlanta, and the IOC justified what looked like a bodgy decision and said it was the technical committee's recommendation. Now, if they were fair dinkum, they had to give it to Sydney, and they did. Oh, I, I was afraid there was going to be another bodgy vote. Oh, did you see John Case? Now, I think he had a tic tac. He was all smart. <laughs> Remember that before the announcement? Yeah. He had a beautiful close-up of John Case, yeah. and he was smiling. I said, Coach, he knows. You know, and that was it. Well, of what course, a wonderful... once the euphoria starts to settle down, they really will have to roll up their sleeves and 
and uh, do some serious work. And quite, yeah, quite right. Now, I think we should pay tribute right now. Remember that eight years ago, Brisbane applied to the Games. Yes. Four years ago, Melbourne applied to the Games. And without the knowledge gained from those two bids, we would never have won this one. It's an Australian effort. And let's congratulate people like Sally Ann Atkinson, yes. right? John Landy in Melbourne, people like that. who have brought this all together because this really is something for our country. Indeed. What do you say to the people who try to talk it down? We can't afford it. It's the wrong time. Oh, we shouldn't look, be look, doing it. Look, what comes now is that we've got the confidence. All we need in this country is confidence. Yeah. Right? Confidence and the will to go. And remember, the people of Sydney will now be the hosts to everybody from the world. And that it's a responsibility that everybody in this city has. But you are the host, whoever comes here. And I reckon that Australians are the best hosts in the world. And they're going to prove in the year 2000 that anybody who comes to these games, competitor, official, whatever, visitor, related to anybody, they will enjoy this more than any games they've ever been to. Because we can do it. But well, you can't put a cost on that either. Nah, no, look, look, it's what not tangible. Whether anyway? microscope will come on look, tomorrow look, or the next day no, or a few days no, later, I'll tell you, what, you Andrew, can't really look, put a... All you do is you put up any project you like and put Olympic Games project and nobody argues. They did it in Brisbane in 1982 with the Commonwealth Games. No, the worker Joe was, Joe Jim Bill Peterson. He put up Commonwealth Games project, they built new roads, That's right. new this, new that. We will do up our road system, do up our communication system, do up everything. Things that would never have been done otherwise. That's right. Practice, practice that you go, go, gold again. You may need to uh, go, 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 go. stay here this <laughs> no, 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 no. I, didn't, I didn't say gold, gold, gold. I said gold, gold to Australia, gold. And I'll say this time, I was thinking about retiring. I, I've reached the ripe old age of 65, right? I'll be 72 in the year 2000. I've just cancelled my retirement. Hooray! I'm, I'm, I'm going to be still in there because we've got to raise a lot of money and I would be out there right. fundraising for the team, fundraising for Australia. Back to you, Anne. Okay, we expect to see you there too. Thank you very much, Norman May. Let's see what everyone's thinking out in Circular Key with Andy Raymond. Andy, how are you faring out there? Well, the party continues down here, Anne. There's still plenty of people all around. There were 50,000 people here, so rumour has it. And I tell you what, not many people have left, and everyone is enjoying the night. Fellas, how long have you guys been here? All night, man, all it's night. It's a great pick for Sydney, man. Once it's in a lifetime, man, I yeah. Get it, but it's beautiful. 2000! I don't think everyone can get over the fact that we've actually won it. I think everyone was waiting for that word, Beijing. But when the Sydney voice came up, it was absolutely incredible. The party will continue here for hours and hours. Some of these people are asking, can I call a public holiday? I can't, but we'll enjoy the time. And we might get back to you later with a few more characters from down here at Circular Key. Andy Raymond and his element. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's found his level very well there, as indeed everybody seems to this morning. You're watching the Channel 7 telecast of the bid for the 2000 Games and we won Sydney Australia. Stay tuned, we'll be back after this break. The, the winner is Sydney Australia. Congratulations, Sydney, on winning the Olympic bid from one of your major sponsors. Off-road racing 
Stadium style. So Comes to Parramatta Raceway for one night only this Saturday when Triple M presents the Stadium Off-Road Grand Prix. It's four-wheel drive fight night with pickup trucks that will run amok and an American Nissan that V8 Fords won't be missing. Buggy, Tim off and Watch jumping high into the sky. Plus Gaul and Dak in a motocross match race attack. The Triple M Stadium Off-Road Grand Prix, a high-flying family motorsport spectacular. Seven o'clock this Saturday night at Parramatta Raceway. Do it. Solomon's are Australia's largest carpet retailers with more carpets, more style, more stores, more experience and more value for money. That's why for over 100 years we've always said there's magic in a Solomon's carpet. Magic carpet Solomon's Carpets. Call in or call us and we'll come to you. Don't you know it's magic? What's inside a Chup and Chup's fantasy ball? <coughs> Football! <laughs> B -b Basketball! Anyone for tennis balls? Fantasy ball lollipops. See them and suck them. It's a delicious bubblegum ball. Fantasy ball. Mouthfuls of fun from Chupa Chups. Seamy Street, KFC at Parramatta Road, Granville. Here at Mutual Pool Renovations, we take real pride in tackling jobs like these. Whether you want a new interior for your pool, a change of coping, new filter pool fencing, a new spa, or even a total change of shape, it's no problem from Mutual Pool Renovations. Take this, give it a smooth river pebble on the inside, coping of split sandstone, add a waterfall, and it's Mutual Pool Renovation Magic. You've nibbled Nobby's normal nuts. Now nibble Nobby's hot nuts. In spicy chilli or satay. On the eve of the 93 Grand Final, seven news documentaries present a premier tribute to the legends of league. Rugby League's most enduring image eventually transformed itself into the Winfield Cup. Hear tales of the great names like Gasnier, Raper, Churchill and Messenger. He was free. Relive the great Grand Final. Sattler continued to play for the remaining 75 minutes with a broken jaw. And find out how Bozo Fulton got his name. Oh, they caught plenty of other things, I can tell you. A premier special, 6.30 Saturday on 7. They're still singing, hip hip hooray! <laughs> and they'll be singing for a long time to come yet. Oh gosh, the celebrations are not only going on here at Circular Quay, all over Sydney. The parties are in full swing and around Australia as well. Let's go to Melbourne now, where Kate Payton has uh, an Australian man who's been to two Olympic Games, a silver medalist. He knows what it's all about, Gary Neewell. Well, what an absolutely fantastic result. I'm here at the Olympian Room at Southgate in Melbourne, and the crowd has gone absolutely wild, of course. We've had a couple of rounds of Advanced Australia Fair, and I'm joined now by a man who's got two Olympics under his belt. He's wearing the right T-shirt. He's a betting man, and uh, Gary, you bet for Sydney, and uh, you would have won. Yeah, unbelievable. Uh, Sydney put up their best bid, and uh, you know they come through in the end. Thoroughly deserved, and uh, I've already got two Olympics. I'm going for another two now. I want to win gold in Sydney. So we're likely to see you back in 2000. You're going to be incredibly old, 34. Oh, thank you. I'll be 34, but uh, that'll be my swan song. I'm going to go out with a gold medal in Sydney. It is absolutely fantastic. Now, of course, I suppose Barcelona was the highlight of your career. That must stay with you forever and a day. It does, but uh, you know. Being here and being part of this all today, when it when it comes to Sydney, Australia, you know, I'm feeling as happy now as I ever have before. It's, you know, it's just a great feat. Oh, it's fantastic. You're very glad that you uh, stayed up all night then to see it happen? Oh, I stayed up all night. I, yeah, I wouldn't forgive myself if I wasn't here tonight. I, you know, I was pleased to be asked to come here tonight and then uh, to hear the announcement from over Sydney, Australia. You know, it's fabulous. What can I say? 
Of course, our most successful Olympic to date, 13 gold medals in 1956. I'm sure an Olympics in the Southern Hemisphere has a huge effect on athletes. How will it affect people's training? Well, you know, we'll, we'll still go to Europe. We'll still go to Europe and train, and uh, nothing will probably change. We'll just come back to Australia and finalise all our training. But yeah, you know, there's a lot of up-and-coming kids out there now that would be that would have been watching TV, hearing the result, and uh, there's a lot of athletes out there now planning gold medals already. Well, it'll be fantastic to see. Thank you very much, Gary. And that's all from us here at the moment in Melbourne. But congratulations, Sydney. Thank you very much, Kate. And indeed, they're celebrating right around Australia. But from Melbourne to Manchester now, and the reaction to that city's losing bid is like Well, hello, Australia. Welcome to Manchester. Night time here. As you can hear behind me, they're trying to look on the bright side of life here. It's been a huge gathering in Manchester. As the announcement drew near, everyone had gathered in the square, 20,000 people here, all holding their breath, waiting for that magic moment, that big decision to come down. You could feel the tension in the air, everyone just praying, hoping that it would be Manchester. But alas, Sydney, great news for Australia, but very sad news for Manchester. They'd put in a very credible bid, they thought at least, Work has been going on here for the last couple of years. The stadiums are all in place, or well on the way, should I say. The government backing here has been enormous in Britain, with the major government saying it will contribute as much money as needed to make the game successful in the year 2000. Transport facilities had been upgraded. The Manchester International Airport is second to none in the world. One of the big pluses Manchester thought too was that the travelling time to Manchester for more than 50% of the athletes would be less than seven hours. But that's all history now. Sydney has the games, you beauty. And uh, so all they can do here now is, is still celebrate. They're trying to make the best of it. And uh, the partying will go on behind me for some hours to come yet. One thing you can say about the people of Manchester, they are a very cheery lot. They'll have a pint. I guess tomorrow it'll be business as usual. They may even say, well done, Sydney. So, from Mike Smithson in Manchester, a very good morning and congratulations to everyone in Sydney and Australia. Thank you, Mike Smithson. Well, Manchester's disappointment is Sydney's delirium. The partying continues here in the Harbour City as dawn breaks. And among those partying and why not, Melinda Gainsford. She's now with Joanna Griggs. That's right, the sun is just about to rise on what would have to be Sydney's greatest day. Melinda Gainsford is with me. She's a 100 and 200 metre running specialist. Melinda is training for the 2000 Olympics. How do you think it will be in front of a home crowd, Melinda? Oh, it's going to be absolutely fantastic. I just can't believe tonight when I was standing there looking up on the board, I was actually down with the rest of Sydney, the, the general public, and it was amazing. When they heard Sydney, I, I think I jumped about, you know, two metres ten or something. <laughs> so much for the hamstring, but, oh, it's great. I, I just can't believe, and I hope that in my career that I'll be running here in front of Sydney now, and if things all go well, I shall be. It's a wonderfully emotional time when they actually announced it. I was saying earlier that everybody jumped, everybody hugged everyone. Did that happen downstairs as well? Oh, definitely. I know people um, knowing, you know, that I'd been to the Olympics and saying, Melinda, quick, give me high fives. And oh, I had to hold back the tears, I think. It's just, it's incredible. You know, I just, I sit here and still in shock and thinking, wow, I'm going to compete in front of my home country. It's wonderful. It's Melinda Gainsford. We're out here in front of the Harbour Bridge. We have the most beautiful backdrop. You'd have to believe, you've travelled a fair bit with your running, Melinda. Is Sydney the greatest place in the world or what? Definitely. When I lit up the, um, uh, over at the Opera House tonight, I just was walking along. I've been to Monte Carlo. That's beautiful, but there's nothing that compares to the Sydney Harbour. And that was one of the reasons why we got it. And obviously, obviously Samaranch and the others have seen it and uh, see what we had to offer. So here we are. We'll keep right behind Melinda and everybody else. Thank you very much, Joanna Green. Well, they're celebrating, all right. They're celebrating right over Sydney and right around Australia. And so too is Jeff Bruce. He's at East Sydney Hotel as uh, they announce the winner. The, the winner is Sydney. <laughs>
I guess that scene is typical of what's happening right around the country. I don't know if that's every reporter's dream or every reporter's nightmare, but there he is, reflecting uh, the glory of the whole of Australia on this glorious morning as dawn breaks over Sydney Harbour. It is indeed a really marvellous day. Share the spirit, Australia. Sydney has won the rights to host the Olympics in the year 2000. Come back to us in just a few moments. Congratulations, Sydney, on winning the Olympic bid from one of your major sponsors. You've seen them at the Olympics. Now, top international gymnastics is coming to Sydney. See some of the world's best gymnasts compete at the Nikon International. Sydney Entertainment Centre, November 17 to 20. 17 countries, including Romania, Russia, the Ukraine, the United States and China. November 17 to 20, Sydney Entertainment Centre. Information and tickets available at Ticketek, 266-4800. Book now and be there for the action of the Nikon International Gymnastics. Mommy said she found a new home. Oh, yeah. Do you want to see it? What now? Sure, no problems. Meet you there in 20 minutes. You know, darling, I think you might have found it. Nobody does it better. Thank you, Mr. Hooker. LJ Hooker, you're the best. This engine has two valves per cylinder. It needs a highly resilient oil for long-lasting protection. Castrol GTX2. This engine has four valves per cylinder. It's a multi-valve and needs the protection of an easier flowing oil. Castrol GTX3. Both develop the same power, but because engines aren't engines, oils ain't oils. Castrol GTX2 and Castrol GTX3. Liquid engineering for your car. Now, switch on to Ryder's huge clearance of TVs. Top brands at incredible prices. Sanyo, Sharp, JVC, Akai, Grundig, NEC and many more. So for the best cash price on TVs, get into Ryder. Open seven days till late. Durham Bicycle's smart drive washing machine spins clothes so fast, drying time is cut by 30%. Smart drive from the innovators at Fisher and Bicycle. Gee, uh, looks like we're going out. Yeah. I was thinking, like, wouldn't it be great if we had the power to change the world? Oh, and solve all its problems in a blinding flash of light? Dream on. So, so, so there will be more understanding, yo. Black or white, no matter dead, no hood, no nation. Tell it, brother. No race, just face. One mission, the global tribe. Sister, can you think? Collect ten tokens from specially marked twisty packs and a sun-sensitive colorblind t-shirt could be ours free. Yo. Sunday on 7, join the screen's greatest action hero. Where am I now? For the ride of your life. And by the time it's over... You'll be lobotomized. The adventure's breathtaking. Hello, I'm Johnny Cat. Johnny Cat. Fasten your seatbelt. The special effects are staggering. And Schwarzenegger's ticked off. Big Arnie with Basic Instinct Sharon Stone. Nissan presents Total Recall. 8.30 Sunday on 7. Well, it's daylight here in Sydney now. The celebrations continue. I'm glad it's light because they can see each other out on the water now. <laughs> They're not going to run into each other. You were getting worried there, weren't you? I was getting very concerned. Because there's plenty of activity out on Sydney Harbour, as Sharing the spirit in Australia because we've got the games and sharing the spirit right now with us is Nicole Stevenson, a dual Olympian already in Seoul and in Barcelona, bronze medalist there in the 200 backstroke and keeping on. I think there's a lot of athletes that have changed their uh, mind as to when they're going to retire. I mean, Norman's done it, so I think there's a few athletes. I'd hardly call Are him an saying? athlete. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen you change change your heart about competing in the 2000? I think so. I mean, I'll be 29, so I'm not over the hill, but I've been doing this for a long time. That's seven years down the track. Definitely, what a great chance for kids oh. out there, Sydney, Australia. 
When it was announced that Sydney had won the games, how did you feel? I was up at Centre Point Tower. Fantastic. The people there, they were, they were just, we were trying to guess what was going to happen. Trying to look at Kevin yeah. Gosper and think, yeah. you know, and he looked so sombre. <laughs> and we thought, no, we haven't got it. And it just erupted. You've yes. been to two games. You know what it's like to, to travel a long way and to compete. I mean, being able to compete in your own backyard with, with your family, your friends, everybody right there must be an enormous boost. Fantastic. Just wonderful. I mean, and also, I guess, being on home turf and knowing uh, the actual facilities that you're going to be competing in, that must make a big difference. It too. does. The pool will be ready, I think, next year. And, you know, we've got six years to train in it. So we've definitely got the hometown advantage with it. That's a lot of training. It is a lot of training. <laughs> <laughs> now, at the moment, you're training for the Commonwealth Games. Yes, Victoria and Island Canada next year. And um, hopefully it'll be a good one. How are you pacing yourself? Just starting to get back into it now. Um, Pre-season at the moment. So should be a good year. Then comes Atlanta and, and the big one. The big one. Sydney 2000. It's a great here. feeling, isn't it? <laughs> it is a sensational feeling on this very, very beautiful morning here this morning on Sydney Harbour as dawn breaks over this sparkling city. Finally, the rest of the world are going to know just how beautiful we are. Do we yes. want to let them all in? Well, as long Ooh. as they go home again afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> it is indeed a magnificent sight as the sun starts to come up over the harbour. You can see the lights are coming on. I guess those people were woken up rather rudely at about 4.30 when we first saw Was the fireworks. Asleep? too. Was I mean, Well, they were at 4.30 when the fireworks works came up to herald the fact that Look Sydney that. had won Look the Olympics. That. Indeed, there is uh, the beautiful opera house there and it is just a very, very magical morning. Well, John Casey this morning was at the Hard Rock Cafe in Sydney when the winner was announced. Well, this is the scene at the Hard Rock Cafe here in Sydney. Jubilation for everyone involved. They cannot believe that Sydney has won the right to host the year 2000 Olympic Games. They've been partying here behind me now since about confidence here in the crowd. They never really expected that we were going to win, I don't think, with such a strong push for Beijing. But when the call went up from Juan Antonio Samaranch that Sydney had won the right to host the game, well, it was utter confusion. But I can assure you, I have never seen anything like what we've seen here tonight. Also in the streets around Sydney, the people are euphoric. Sydney has won the right to host the year 2000 Games. Uh, can't wait for it to happen indeed. It's going to be a long, long party. But uh, once the euphoria is over, I guess that's when the real work begins. I suppose what well, the first thing we need to do is get over to Atlanta and see just how their uh, preparations are going for the next games to see what they're doing, what went wrong, um, and learn from their experiences. Well, I guess they're hoping nothing's going to go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, indeed. A lady with us at the moment who uh, is very happy celebrating this morning is Anne Keating. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Now, how are you feeling when you uh, heard the news? Absolutely elated. I'm sure everybody is. Yes, I think that uh, the elation is something that not only Sydney, but the whole of Australia must be feeling at the moment. You must have seen the big brother standing there on the television. A good coup for him. Very proud of him, yes, yes, yes. What do you think the implications will be on a federal level? I think it's going to give the whole economy a great boost, a great shot of confidence. It's wonderful for everybody. Great for Sydney, but great for the nation. I saw you talking on a mobile phone earlier. You weren't picking up the phone to speak to him directly, were you? No, I was. I was ringing my mother, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Mim, what did she say, Mrs. Keating, she was, this morning? She was thrilled. She's been closely involved with it all. Yeah, and she was up watching yes, the announcement yes, as well. Yes, Now, tell me, uh, you were very involved.